Good morning, fellow council. Good morning, members of the public, both here and um, abroad. We propose um, getting started in about two minutes. So I'm inviting everyone now to get to their respective stations. Today starts our third session of public hearings. You will recall that the first session ran for four days, and the second session ran for two weeks but included a public holiday, so we got nine days of work. So today is day 14, and we will continue with the testimony of Mr. Alan Gates. I'm told that he's here and um, we invite him to come to the witness stand. Mr. Chairman, before we proceed, may I respectfully crave the indulgence of the Commission for a brief moment? Yes, in a moment. I just want to conclude by saying that this session will run until Wednesday next week. This will be an eight-day session. We'll run until Wednesday next week. All right. Um, Mr. Ahmed? Yes, please, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm on record as a member of the legal team representing the PNCR at this commission. I now respectfully wish to seek your leave to withdraw and discontinue that representation on, on the following grounds. 
First of all, Mr. Chairman, I'm convinced that the present representation provided by Mr. Basil Williams and Mr. James Bond is more than adequate to represent the party's interests as they have been doing an excellent job so far. Mr. Chairman, I have been approached by the ex-GDF Association, among which number several former members of the Guyana Defense Force, the Guyana People's Militia, and the Guyana National Service. Um, and in that number, there are at least three former chiefs of staff of the Guyana Defense Force, one director general of the National Service, and a commandant of the Guyana People's Militia. And they request that I represent their interests at this commission of inquiry. Mr. Chairman, the ex-servicemen that I speak about are scattered at all corners of this earth. And by the wonders of technology, they are able to follow and have been following this commission on a daily basis. Mr. Chairman, it is difficult to comprehend the significant impact which this commission of inquiry has had on the community of former servicemen of the GDF, the GNS, and the GPM. In particular, as it relates to terms of reference number four of this commission of inquiry, which requires the commission to examine and report on the actions of act and activities, um, among other things, of the Guyana Defense Force, the Guyana National Service, and the Guyana People's Militia, and those who are in command and superintendent of these agencies. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, there are persons who have distinguished themselves in the area of politics, the arts, religion, and science whose credibility and reputation now stand to be tarnished by negative issues which emanate from this commission concerning their command and service in the forces. Persons whose names, Mr. Chairman, adorn the Hall of Fame in the Western world. Persons who have built roads, bridges, and rails in the United States of America. Had it not been for the work of these officers and men, Guyana would have been a different place today. They have put their lives in harm's way to ensure that aggression was defined on our borders, that the territorial integrity of this country remained intact. And so, as a former member myself of the Guyana Defense Force, Mr. Chairman, who I served for over 23 years in that institution and rose to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, I can understand and empathize with the sentiments expressed by these former officers. Mr. Chairman, it is for these reasons that I respectfully seek your leave to withdraw and discontinue my representation of the PNCR and re request that you consider my application to represent the ex-GDF Association in these proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you, too. I've taken note of your vote of confidence in Mr. Basil Williams and, um, and his team. Yes. <laughs> for the PNC, uh, yes. uh, but I must tell you that I, I'm not sure after your speech, um, the parties that you are representing, you mentioned quite a few. Um, could you, in a very succinct way, tell me um, those for whom you seek representation? The ex-GDF Association, please, Mr. Chairman. Yes. And the ex-GDF association comprises? No, no, no. Is there any other organization? I, uh, think no, I... no, please. Oh. That is it. That was an elaborate uh, elaboration of... It was an elaboration of, uh, the, uh, of the, the quality of, of service provided by these officers and distinguished um, men of this country that well, I, I seek to represent, please. Mr. Chairman, I, I thought my colleague said also GNS and GPM. Yeah, I think you yeah. should clarify that. That the XGDF, that includes them. Yes, indeed. Yes. It includes them. That's what I said. Yeah. And the National Service and the Guyana yeah. Militia. Yes, I think that what yeah. Mr. Williams was alluding to was. That's why we have to. He, say he that. understood why, why, why I was uncertain. Yeah. 
Yes, but I'm now clear. I'm now well, clear. Thanks very much for that clarification, yes. please, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, uh, Mr. Williams, for adding clarity to the matter. Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, I'm also seeking a little more clarity. May I please inquire through the Commission whether Mr. Harmon is represented, representing Major General Norman McLean, retired, and whether he is intending to call any witnesses. Mr. Chairman, Major General Norman McLean is already a witness for the Commission. And I do not now seek to, to overturn what has been happening before. Uh, I have no intention at this point in time. I will be briefed. I will take instructions from, from those whom I represent. And at the appropriate time, if it becomes necessary, then uh, once they have to appear before the commission, they will put themselves in order. <coughs> well, I'm happy to report that we I've now put you on record as representing the ex-GDF Association. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Any other applications, observations, submissions from Council? Um, if not, I'll inquire of Commission Council whether they're ready to proceed. Councillor, uh, please proceed. Um, I, I think that given the long break, it's useful that he be reached the Do you, Robert Allen Gates, swear that the evidence that you shall give in this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Gates. Good morning. On the last occasion, if I could summarize for you, we were around October 1980. You were at the Eve Leary headquarters of the Guyana Police Force. Yep. And you had just been put into a car. Yes, sir. Um, You claim that the persons who put you into that car, you recognize some of them to be members of the Ghana Police Force Special Branch Unit. Yes, sir. Just for clarification, can you tell us, at that time, who was the head of the Special Branch of the Ghana Police Force? I really can't recall because uh, James Mentor had departed, uh, and I really can't say who was the head of the Special Branch at the time. I really can't recall. Mr. Chairman, the record has that he said it was Laurie Lewis. Here's evidence. Laurie Lewis was the head of the Joint Service Intelligence. As far as he my said knowledge. he was also the head of Special Branch. That's his evidence. 
question then is uh, does that intervention help you to well, recall? As, as the head of the Joint Service Intelligence, the special branch will fall under him. So you, you accept now? Yes, I, I will accept. Yes, that he's, he was. And that name is? So Larry Lewis. Larry Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Can you tell us what happened after you were placed into the car, if anything? I was blindfolded and driven out to the compound. And I was taking a wrong turn in an effort to uh, not allow me to know where exactly I was being taken. But the blindfold was, um, I could have seen on it. So after driving around for about 20 minutes, I was taken into the compound of the special branch headquarters, which is opposite the Queen's College on Camp Street. I was placed in a cell for 30 days. I was interrogated, threatened, you were interrogated by whom? Do you know um, who you interrogated? Well, for was? the first couple of days, I, whenever they took me out of the cell, I was blindfolded. But on, the, on about the 30th day, when the cell was open, the instructions I got is that whenever persons are approaching the cell, I should face the wall and allow myself to be blindfolded. Um, on the 30th day, Mr. Gates, don't go too fast. Okay, sir. How soon can you inquire of him whether he was blindfolded while in the cell for 30 days? Not all the time, sir. Only when they're coming for me to, to, to be interrogated. But did you recognize the person who was blindfolding you on each occasion that their interrogations were about this time? No, sir. Can you give us an idea about what the interrogations were about? Um, they were accusing me of working for the CIA, um, of being sympathetic to the WPA, and withholding information, a whole host of stuff. You know. Council, could you get him clarify this whole heap of stuff? Yeah, could you expand a little bit more? Like, like I said, I was being accused of working for the CIA. I was being accused of being sympathetic towards the WPA, and I wasn't reporting everything that happened during my uh, uh, undercover assignment with the WPA. And, and in answer to these allegations, what did you say? Anything? I, I deny them. You denied all of them? I denied all. And are you suggesting that throughout this interrogation progress process, you were always blindfolded? Yeah, whenever I, I'm being interrogated. Before Good. I leave the cell, they, they would blindfold me and I. Four, four or five different persons will be asking me questions I simultaneously. See. Were you able to recognize any of the voices that were interrogating you? Afterwards, on the 30th day, when they came to the cell, and they didn't request that I face the wall, and, uh, I thought maybe uh, that was judgment day. What, what do you mean by that? No, well, I would have been killed. Because all the time I'm not seeing, I'm not allowed to see people's face. Then on that day they came rushing, they opened the door. Uh, I recognized Mr. Eddington Tappin. Uh, I don't think he was an inspector then. 
Um, he asked me if I knew Mr. Hamilton Green. I said, if I knew Mr. Hamilton Green. Please slow down a little bit, Mr. Gaines. I think you are making the error which I tried to correct on the last occasion. You are speaking without opening your mouth. First, first rule. Go ahead, please. I did not respond to his inquiry. I was then taken back to CID headquarters. Did, did you know Mr. Hamilton Green? When that question was asked of you, did you in fact know him? Not personally. And why did you choose not to respond? Because I didn't know where they were coming from. Yeah. You know, because um, I was being accused of a lot of things. Can you, the, you, you were not blindfolded at this stage? No, sir. And, and you were not facing the wall? Or? No, they, 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 they told me not to when the door was open. So what happened next? If anything? Well, I was taken back to CID headquarters, to the office of... Uh, then Prime Chief Sister Skip Roberts, who told me that um, all that happened, um, he did not play any part. It was Larry Lewis's uh, instructions. But, but what, do you, did you understand what he meant by all that happened? What was you knew what he was? No, well, I was, I, I was kept in the special branch lock of authority. Days. You felt that that was what he was referring to. Yes, that, that was what he was. Yes, but I didn't follow what, he, what Roberts was saying about that. Could you repeat what Roberts Mr. said? Mr. Roberts that? said to me that he, he did not give any instructions, and it was Larry Lewis who did, who gave the instructions. Please continue. I was released and I proceeded to my mother's home at 19 Hartfield Street Lodge in Georgetown. This would have been around what date, please? Uh, it was sometime 30 days after I was, maybe sometime in November of 1980, if I can recall. You went to your mother's home? Yeah, and she told me that from the day after I was arrested, right. she visited the offices of the then Commission of Police. Mr. Lloyd Barker. Who after making some inquiries on the telephone. told her that he was too small to deal with the matter. <laughs> he then referred her to the then Minister of Home Affairs.
you know who was the then Minister of Home Affairs? Mr. Stanley Moore. Who also, after making some inquiries on the telephone, Did you say that she did go to the office of the She did go Mr. to the Stanley office Moore? of the she... then commissioner and the then minister of affairs. And she overheard? Him making inquiries. She didn't know who he was speaking to. I see. And he also told her that he can't do anything. It's way above him. How did you, what did you understand um, this minister to be saying? Well, he's too he... small to deal with the matter. But did you have any sense, perception of who, who, who was big enough to, do, to deal with it? What was he saying? You, 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 you knew or you didn't? Well, I was told the hours was coming from the, the head of state. Or, or the Prime Minister, then I can't remember who exactly it was. That's the impression my mother got. I'm going to ask you so much about her impression, about yours. Yeah, I, I felt so also. I felt strongly. Just for clarification, your mother is still alive? No, she's dead. What happened next? She said she went home feeling, uh, not knowing what next to do. Then the neighbor advised her to go to the offices of Mr. Hamilton Green. Mr. Gates, try to throw back your memory. You said your you got the same impression as your mother did. Are we talking about 19 November 1980? Yes, sir. Who was the head of state then? I don't know whether he was, I can't recall whether he was Prime Minister or, or Mr. Barnum. Was the head of state? I can't recall if he was Prime Minister then or, or President. I really can't recall. But he was the head of state, whatever yeah. capacity. Head of government, he was. head of state. According to your mother, she visited Mr. Hampton Green's office. He visited his office, told him what had transpired, that she visited the office of the commissioner and the minister of home affairs. What they told her, she said he immediately picked up his telephone. and gave instructions for me to be released immediately. You have no idea who he may, may have given those orders to? I don't know, sir. And according to your mother, how long after that telephone call was made were you released? About half an hour. Just a question, and just for the record, what was the official position of Mr. Hamilton Green at the time? He was Deputy Prime Minister, responsible for housing and planning, I think. His office was on Home Stretch Avenue in Georgetown. And may I ask, did your mother indicate why she went to the offices of Mr. Hamilton Green? She was advised to do so by a neighbor after she didn't get any results from the then commissioner and the then minister of home affairs. Thank you. you. You 
just told us you, according to what your mother said, you were released about half of an hour after that phone call was made. Yes, sir. So, um, what next did you do? Well, I, after I, she I, told I, you the story, I, I went home and she told me I should go the next day and thank Mr. Hamilton Green. You did so. Yes, the following day at about 9 at 9 a.m., I visited his office Where? And, and at, on Home Stretch Avenue and was met by his chief security, Mr. Michael Goodluck, who was then an inspector of police. Yes. You met Inspector Goodluck? Yeah, and he ushered me. He, uh, he told me to sit, and after about 10 minutes, he ushered me into the Deputy Prime Minister's office. Go ahead, please. I met Mr. Green, who apologized for what I've been through over the last 30 days. <coughs> he also took the opportunity to offer me a job in, the, in his advanced security section. Did he explain to you the, what the job was about? Well, it, it was about if he was going to Barbies, you have an advanced part. He would go before and um, yeah, the intelligence on whether it was safe for him to travel to a particular area. That, that's the purpose of advanced parties. You would call it in, 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 in military terms, wrecking the area, you know, or the village. I didn't get that military expression. Pardon me? The military expression. Recky. That would be short for reconnaissance, would it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Surveillance, intelligence gathering, all those of stuff. <clears throat> had you known the Deputy Prime Minister before? Had you ever met him before? You, I think you had already said you had never met I never Mr. Hamilton Green okay, before. So I never I met him first. So you were offered this job. Did you accept it? No, or? sir. I told him that um, I needed some time to focus on other stuff. You know. I need some time to relax, to think. And I, I will always recall his words as I was going through the door. He said, oh, there is very rough. How did you feel when those words were uttered to you? Well, I knew, as a former member of the intelligence department, that I would have been kept under surveillance until such time as the authorities felt well. I was no longer a threat to national security. Did you use rough or tough? Rough. rough said yeah. out there is rough. Two weeks later, I sought and gained employment with uh, Diana's top private security agency at the time, the GB Security Services. As a special investigator. One day while on an 
undercover mission at Georgetown American Seafoods. That agent, that company was a client of the GB Security Services. What happened, please? Go ahead. Can you forward the narrative? Okay. See the confirmation. Go ahead, please. I was summoned to the offices of the GB Security Services. Private security company. They were at the time responsible for securing the, all the American, Canadian, and British premises. Go ahead, please, Mr. Gates. I, was, I, I visited the offices of the then Chief Security Officer of GB Security Services. Mr. Courtney Lynn. Who informed me that the GB Security Services was in receipt of a letter from Mr. Larry Lewis. advising them that I was a threat to national security. And that they should not continue to employ me. I was immediately fired. And three weeks later, I sought and gained employment at the then American Life Insurance Company, now North American Insurance Company. What were you employed as? Sales representative. And how long did that term of employment last? About three months, I, I had to go through an initial period of training. And why, why, did, why, why did it only last three months? On the very first day of securing my first client, I, I visited the office to hand over monies. I, I, was, I was attached to the Cannes Agency. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, please. Yeah, I was attached to the Cannes Agency when the secretary to Mr. Afis Khan informed me that about 10 men in Shorjak were there asking for By sure, Jack, you're referring to the... Um, the cheeky type of... A short Jack, you know, is worn out of the pants. Well, who would normally wear that type of um, um, shirt? Well, I asked the secretary whether it was men from the CID. She said her husband works at the CID. And, and, and she saw a couple of them. Um, they were more or less from the special branch of presidential security. Well, special branch of presidential I didn't hear... They were more, she felt that they were from special branch Special aware? branch, or, or at that time, the special branch controlled the presidential security. So President's the, security? The presidential security. Presidential but the bodyguards security. then. They, they came under the special branch. I see. And you, you, you were aware that those persons would, some, would, would yeah, wear she, a shirt, Jack, as yeah. well? And, and a description she gave me of one of them, I 
kind of recognize him. All right. So she told you that these men had come with Sir Jax. Yes, and I realized that um, something was not right, so I handed over the money and stuff. And I caught a taxi and headed to my mother's home. Well, you became afraid when you heard that these men had come? Yeah, because I, 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 I thought it was going to be another 30 days in hell. Oh, I see. So you were able to avoid them? Yeah, I, I, I went home. And upon entering, yeah, but they, they were there for, uh, to see you. Uh, you yeah, managed to avoid them. You took a route through Yeah, the because they, they, they didn't stay long. When I got there, they were not there. So I thought maybe they were out on the streets looking for me. So my intention was to go home and pack my bag and head in the head to the jungle. <laughs> and you did that? When I got home, the house was filled with members of the special branch. Um, there was one CID officer who had accompanied them, as, as is normal, as, as the standard operating procedure. He was Inspector Adams from CID headquarters. He told me that they are in receipt of information that I was working for the CIA and that I was planning to overthrow the government of Guyana by force. I denied such allegations. told me that they would like to conduct a search of the premises in my presence. I told them I don't have a problem, they can proceed. They proceeded to my bedroom, and from under the bed, they, they retrieved a cartoon box with some documents, which I'll explain where I got it from. What, what, what documents were these? The documents, yeah, but they, they, they made an allegation that I was working for this guy. So I knew the documents that they found could have linked me innocently to what they were accusing me of. The part, the, the documents, uh, it was on a letterhead which stated, United States of America Department of State Telegram. And then they have a, a, the, the rest of the, the documents blank. I obtained those documents as a special investigator at GB Security Services. I was required to visit all embassies to make surprise visits. I normally had the inspectors doing the visits, but as a the private investigator, he was required to make surprise visits. Go. I, I think you can go ahead. Yes. So you, one evening while visiting the U.S. Embassy, which was at the time on Main Street, Georgetown. Uh, normally, they would discard old stationery in the garbage bin. So I, the guard told me that uh, there was some stuff there that I might be interested in. So I saw these documents, and I, I picked them up. And what I normally do, I, I would tear off the letterhead and use the plain paper to write reports to the GB, the GB on, on, on whatever investigations I was doing. So I explained that to them, and they said they don't believe my story. I was under arrest. Why, why would you do that? Was it stationary or short in the country? Pardon me? Why would you do that? Why would you retrieve these? Yeah, because at the time, stationary, there was a shortage of stationary. Yeah, but you have to tell us, you know, because we can't. Yeah, there was, a, there was a shortage of stationary in the country. Even GB at the time, you know, the paper was very expensive. 
people have to smuggle it in sometimes from Suriname, pure soap. So the police found that stationery with that American letterhead, and you said you were arrested? I was arrested and taken to Bregdam Police Station. And how, how long you kept there? Ten days. At the time, I can recall, there were some uh, very dangerous criminals at the time in the Lock Ops Christmas Pig Tucker. And um, they were beating people, uh, taking away people's food, the other inmates' food when they go in. So I can recall when the officer, I can't recall exactly who's the person that booked me. But when he put me into the Lock Ops, he told Christmas Pig and Tucker, but there's a old policeman, he got a problem, you all deal with him. And he walked away. Oh, I see. I immediately... You, you know what you, what you were booked there for? What was the offense? Treason. When the officer turned away, I was surrounded by five men, which included Christmas Pig on top of Christmas Pink. Christmas Pig. That was the Pig or Pink? Pig. Pig. Christmas Pig, yeah. And he, at the time, was... He, he was being held in some murder robbery or something. I see. Tucker was his uh, co-accused. He was also being held for murder robbery. So when the police walked away, they drew their sharpened the instruments and I told them I said hey these guys are setting me setting you up so that you can kill me and they can have something to nail you on I said you guys had anything to eat I said no I said well you hold on my mother will be here shortly and you will get to roti and curry and stuff so when my mother came I sent her to buy some roti and curry and I fed them and I was kept there for and the guys started protecting me. They said, look, whenever they come to you, we, gonna be, we are going to represent you. They can't remove you from here and take you to beat you or anything. So when they came back, they were surprised that I was still alive. I was removed from the, from the cell. And um, the TSU came in and, and killed them. That's on record. The TSU what? The TSU ranks came in. Well, when they came to them, the guys went to the back of the lockups and they started bailing feces and throwing it at the officers. And they were shot. The place was tear gas. Feces. There was a pool of feces floating around in the lockups. So the guys started taking buckets and throwing it at the officers. When you say the guys, you mean Christmas pig, Christmas tucker, pig tucker, and, other and others. And others. Start throwing it at the TSU. Ramps yes, ramps. Officer, I haven't got all those details. Who approached them? And they were throwing feces at them. Go slowly. I want to be very clear. Who is it that approached them? Officers from there. Members of the tactical services unit. Tactical services? Services unit, TSU. And that was what? Days after Christmas? Yeah, it might, might be. I, I really can't recall because <laughs> this this would be beyond 1980, or yeah, no, no, no. That would be close to Christmas, I think. Yeah. Oh, close I see. To Christmas. You mentioned that your mother was bringing turkey and so on uh, for you. It seemed to me that that was Christmas food. Yeah, and I shared it to the guys. Well, is that not helping you to remember whether it was around Christmas time? No, no. Roti and curry is prepared at any time. Yes, but the, the turkey and so on in those days suggest that it was Christmas. Uh, it could be, it could be. Uh, all, all I know it was 82. This was 82? 82, 1982. Uh, are you watching yes, that turkey would have been in short supply mm -hmm. then? Yeah, those, uh, those were delicacies, you know. <laughs> 
Mr. Chairman, is the witness saying this happened in 82? I was just, I, I was trying to give the, the commission an idea of what took place, what, what, what I encountered, what I suffered, you know, you know, after I refused to do certain things. I mean, it might be going beyond the commission's okay, mandate. Uh, we'll stop here if we thought that you were going beyond, but uh, um, just let him complete what he's saying. Yes, so, okay, on the end, you said, you, you, you had said something a bit startling. You said that the TSU ranks had gone into the lockups and yeah, killed uh, persons. Killed persons, big on top of. Yes, but you see, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, I think we are going way beyond the remit in the terms of reference. I think this witness, I assume from his evidence, came to talk about surveillance, etc. But all that is finished. He's out of that. So how relevant is what happened in the prison? Is he going to bring us up to the current status of, that he has in the prison? <laughs> Well, I think so I, I'm respectfully um, suggesting that he has gone past the 1980 that we have been delimited by. And this is, the relevance has to be, it has to be relevant. The, what is the story is telling you about the cell and feces being shown at TSU you know, and all that. Is that relevant to our terms of reference? If, if I may be allowed to respond and point out that the first term of reference deals with uh, facts and circumstances subsequent to the death of Walter Rodney um, in order to determine who or what was responsible for the explosion. So it could very well be that the behavior of the Tactical Services Unit um, in 1982 was symptomatic of the behavior around. Um, I don't have the terms before me, and it did not say after, immediately yes. after. They didn't say immediately. They said to examine the terms and circumstances immediately prior, at the time of, and subsequent to yes. the death of Dr. Walter Rodney in order to determine as far as possible who or what was responsible for the explosion resulting in the death of Dr. Walter Rodney. Subsequent to, uh, just let him complete what he's okay. saying. Uh, it was already on record, but he was going a little too rapidly for me. And I wanted him to be very clear as to who it was well, that had approached these men. I think we, we, we may have completed that aspect of it, but I wish to ask you... Uh, um, I think the chairman is indicating he was going at his past so Could I, thank you. Could I inquire as to your last note then, please, Mr. Chairman? He said that um, he, he arranged through his mother for them to be fed, and in consequence they protected him. Uh, when the members of the tactical services unit approached them, and it could be sometime in 1982, um, I think he had gone on earlier to say that they, they, they were killed by, by these men. Is that correct? Yes, sir. But how killed? But how by they were shot? They or? were shot. They, they, they were, they were tear smoke. And, and, and the officers ran into the cell and shot them. That's after taking out persons who they didn't want to kill. How many persons were killed, as far as you recall? Two, two, two. Chris was big on top, and yeah, Chris was big on top of those were there. The two Chris, persons, could you speak up a little bit? Chris was big and Tucker, they were the two inmates that were killed. So that others were taken away from among them? They were, they were brought outside into the compound so that the police can execute those who they wanted to execute. And after that, you were put back into the cell? No, by then, attorney at law, Mr. Benjamin Gibson, had intervened, and I was released. You were never charged for treason? Never.
think he said he was charged while he was under the prosecutors. Well, I was booked for treason. You were never placed before the no, courts no, no. for the offense of treason. No, sir. But did you ever receive a charge sheet for treason? No, sir. It was just a guy's story. They would book you for all kinds of stuff just to detain you legally. But you were told that you were being arrested for treason? For treason, and I was booked pending inquiries treason. Okay, thank you. Before you move on, Councilor, may I inquire, are you saying you are one of the persons who was taken out of the cell before the shooting took place? Yes, I was one of the persons. But you were in the cell when you saw the men throwing the feces at the police? Yes, I was. Police. Since I have you, how long were you employed to the GB Securities? I think that's what it was. Um, might have been about uh, four to five months, four six five. months. Thank you. Mr. Gates, the testimony that you have given over these few days, is this the first time that you're telling anyone this story? or I had written over the years, the Kaichur, if you check the archives of the Kaichur News and the, the Stafford News, I have always written and expressed a desire to testify at these inquiries. I have also um, told many persons of, of what um, I've been through, what I've been asked to do. The, the, Four or five years ago, I, I, I mentioned this to an honorable gentleman sitting in this, in, 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 in this uh, inquiry room, who was a close friend of Dr. Wooten Ryan. I told him, I said... You don't wish to know, mention his name? Uh, Dio, he's sitting there. He, who is this? Mr. Dio. He's, 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 I said it to him over and over. He's standing there. He's a very close friend of Dr. Wooten Ryan. Yeah. Did you, in 2003, visit the TV studio of CN Sharma? Yes, I did. And tell us what happened. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I must formally object to the line of questioning. Fortunately, I have the term of reference. And we, we have to decide whether we are applying the terms of reference or not. Terms of reference, one, to examine the facts and circumstances immediately prior, at the time of, and subsequent to the death of Dr. Walter Rodney in order to determine as far as possible who or what was responsible for the explosion in the death of Dr. Walter Rodney. So I don't know how these subsequent events are going to help us determine as far as possible who or what was responsible for the explosion resulting in the death of Dr. Dr. Walter Rodney. <laughs> Feces being thrown at TSU ranks and all that in a cell cannot determine how Dr. Rod, um, the late Dr. Walter Rodney met his death. So we really, we stretching it. And so if you go to 2003, where are we going? No, if, how if, is if, this if, going to help us to determine that? I understood the um, recent questioning of the um, commission council to be relating to credibility. You have given us a story here, sensational in many respects. Uh, did you ever mention this to anyone? I thought that that was about to test his credibility. He's testing his own witness's credibility, but that speaks volumes. Well. If that is what is being suggested, if that is what counsel for the commission is doing, then this witness has no place in the box, which well, we firmly believe on this side. I, I'm not sure. Sometimes prosecution counsel uh, <laughs> ask defense counsel questions. So that by the time the defense counsel attack, attempt to ask them, the court may well say that has been uh, asked already. Let's get on. Look, just for clarification, Mr. Chairman, I am attempting to negate any allegation that this is a recent fabrication and to show the uh, consistency. No, no, I am clear. Very well. I am clear. Uh, and my friend should be aware of, 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 of that sort of line of question. You will be aware of what I know I'm aware of shortly. You get ahead, Councillor. You, you, you were about to tell us that you had gone to Mr. Television Station in 2003 
And what you spoke about in that program, was it similar to what you're saying today? Yes, yes, I told them. And I, I told them there are still elements within the Guyana police force who's, who's been persecuting me. But on that TV program in 2003, did you speak about all the events that you were involved in? in, in Most of them. Not, 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 not all of them. Not all of them, but the plot to kill Dr. Ruth Narayan was mentioned. I see. And, and with me disobeying the orders and stuff like that. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, Mr. Chairman, could we, why don't we have this television interview before us? CN Sharma is in existence. Chan, the, the television channel is still in existence. If you're going to bring this kind of evidence up here, why don't we have an extract, a tip of, of those proceedings, of, of his interview or whatever program he had on Channel 6? It's the easiest thing to do. Yes, I agree with you, but you must not exclude that it will be presented. Uh, but thanks for reminding us. Yes. Can you tell us what motivated you to tell this commission your story? It was something that was resting on my conscience, resting on my mind, and I just wanted the, the world to know the truth. And, the, and, and to bring closure to the Rodney's family. Because as a Christian, they says, speak the truth and the truth shall set you free. And open confession is good for the soul. Mr. Chairman, fellow commissioners, I think I've exhausted most of what is in the statement and a little bit more. So that will conclude my examination of this witness, unless there are further questions that are. I've been a to my learned friend that it's not my witness. I suppose the new attorney for the military could start if he wishes, because a lot of evidence has been given against certain ranks, name ranks. And um, my, my colleagues, but I normally would deal with a witness, but it's not my witness. Uh, excuse me, members of the commission, I, I forgot to mention one. I was paid by the Guyana Police Force, up to and including January 21st, 1981, just for the records, which can be verified. January 1981. January 21st, up to and including January 21st, 1981. Thank you. At which time I was given a real letter of release, not a bogus one. Who, who, who signed that letter? Uh, I think it was staff officer, admin. I can't recall exactly who it was. Staff officer admin. He was the signing officer. Mr. Peters, I think I recognize you as padded up and, and walk into the crease. Mr. Peters is not here, Mr. Chairman. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is maybe Mr. Scotland. Mr. Harmon, you are. 
Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, are you ready? Are you ready? Or are you as you'd recognize, Mr. Chairman, I just came. I thank Mr. Williams for deferring so readily to me, but I'm not ready to proceed at this point in time. Ready, Mr. Scotland, please proceed. If you are, I am, can be ready, and I think I can do it. I, I'm ready. Very well. Now, good morning, sir. Morning. Good morning. Would you be more comfortable taking a seat or you? No, sir, I like standing and walk. Stand? Okay. Now, <clears throat> I would like to take you to your evidence especially your witness statement, where you spoke of having conversed with Gregory Smith. Yes, sir. And he told you that he would have had several meetings with one normal Norman McLean. You recall that? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, may I respectfully ask that the witness be shown the transcripts of the Thursday, the 5th of June, 2014, and in particular, page 29, please. And may I ask that the commissioners share that transcript with me. I have my copy here. <clears throat> Do you know, according to you, according to you, Mr. Gates. Yes, sir. Gregory Smith would have told you that from time to time he would meet with Norman McLean and he gave a designation, the head of the army. You yes, sir. You see that in your witness statement? Yes, sir. But, well, you said that in your witness statement. Now, at page 29 of the transcript, you see Major General Retired McLean is saying, with respect to Gregory Smith, I have never met him. If I saw him, I would not have known him. It was not somebody I would know at all. His maritime commander would have known of him, not me. You see that there? That's which part of that? Um, you, you are on page 29. 29. Yeah. Maybe just about in the middle of the page. Show him. Yeah, fifth of June. Show him it, please. <clears throat> Speaking about Gregory Smith. Okay. You see it there? Yeah, sorry. Now, I am asking you, sir. You see what Major General McLean has said about not ever meeting Gregory Smith. Yes, sir. According to your conversations with Gregory Smith, would that be true, what Major General McLean is no, saying? According to what Gregory, Gregory is saying is that he reported to him how true that is, I don't know. That's what he told me. That's what he told you. Yeah. So according to what he told you, what the Major General is saying here is not true. According yeah, to what, yeah, according to what told he told me. Right. Also, I'd like to draw your attention in the same transcript to page 31 of the same transcript. Just go to page 31. Um, where it was said that at the time in 1980, June 1980, where exactly on page 31? In the middle of the transcript, in the middle of the page, where Mr. Hanuman is speaking about Just questioning. Just read it so that those who are following and don't have the transcript before them can be clear about what you're doing. 
It reads, Mr. Hanuman asking Major General Retired McLean, as you sit now, could you say whether the time you joined when you became Chief of Staff, Gregory Smith was a serving member of the GDF? Answer, I do not know, but I would not have thought so. Do you know the circumstance of and him that, being... That answer is from Major General. Major General. Please. Mr. Hanuman, do you know the circumstance of him being struck off the strength of the GDF? If it happened, Major General McLean responds, I'm not aware, as far as I understand, he was a deserter and had deserted for some time. We had a lot of deserters who we had to give amnesty to bring back soldiers who were disgruntled. You saw that? Yes, sir. Now, according to you, sometime in November 1979, you met, you actually had a conversation with Gregory Smith. Yeah. And is it true that he told you that he was an active serving member in the GDF? Yes, he did say it. And you met with him subsequently when he continued to be an active serving member of the GDF? Yes, that's after we, we agreed to share intelligence. So as far as you know, and this is from your own knowledge now, coming from Gregory Smith, he was not a deserter. No, he wasn't. And it will be true to say that he was a serving member at least up to 1980 June in the GDF. Yes, sir. Now, I'd like to take you Mr. Chairman, may I ask respectfully that the witness be shown the terms of reference, Roman numeral 4, please. Yeah, but you, you read them too. So okay, I will. Can follow you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> sir, you see the terms of reference, Roman numeral 4? Yes, sir. To examine and report, well, it goes that the terms of the commission is to act and inquire and to examine and report on the actions and activities of the state, such as the Guyana Police Force, the Guyana Defense Force, the Guyana National Service, the Guyana People's Militia, and those who were in command and superintendents of these agencies to determine whether they were tasked with the surveillance of and carrying out of actions and whether they did execute those tasks and carried out those actions against the political opposition for the period 1st January 1978, 31st December 1980. You see that? Yes, sir. Now, my angle of nemesis is that I represent Donald Rodney, the interest of Donald Rodney, who was charged with the possession of explosives on the night of the 13th of June, 1980. You understand that? Yes, sir. So now let us together examine the various agencies because it's the police acting on the advice of the DPP, I would imagine, that would have charged Donald Rodney. You understand? Yes, sir. And at the time, you were a serving member in the police force. Yes, sir. Did you know at the time a detective constable number 8275 Leslie Stafford? Stafford. Leslie Stafford. Stafford. Yes, he's the one who charged my client. Yeah. Yes, sir. You knew Leslie Stafford? Yes, sir. Now, let's... <clears throat> So we're inquiring into the role of the police. Leslie Stafford, as I see it here, and I don't know how it operates in Guyana, was a detective constable. Now, it means, though, that he was, even though a detective, he was still a constable, isn't that so? Yes, sir. Can you tell the commission how long, am I going too fast, commissioners? How long, as far as you know, he would have been a member in the Guyana Police Force in June 1980? Could you tell us? Look at his regimental number, 8275. What was your regimental number? 10,318. So that means he was in the force before you, correct? Yeah, maybe five, five years. Or five years. Six. So at the time then, you would say 
that he was a serving member. In 1980, he'd have been a serving member for about how long in the Ghana Defense Force? I would say six to seven years. About six. Pardon? Ghana Police Force. Yes, sir. About six to seven years. And he would have worked under the directive, and you will correct me if I'm wrong, of the then Deputy Commissioner of Police, Skip, Skip Roberts. Cecil Alexander Roberts, also known as Skip Roberts. What's his full name? I Cecil Alexander Cecil Roberts. Cecil Alexander Roberts, also known as? Skip Roberts. Skip Roberts. Isn't that so? He would have worked under Cecil Alexander Roberts. Yes, sir. And he would have taken instructions from Cecil Alexander Roberts in the hierarchical structure of the yeah, police because force. Skip Roberts is, is the overall in charge. Yes. Does that and follow logically, though, or that yes. he was taking I, I, am, I am asking the question, the witness will, I don't know. There are times when, 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 when Hold on, Mr. Chairman. normally the superintendent or the inspector above you, uh, is all that you may ever speak to. You, you see, but Mr. Chair, in this case, I'm not shooting in the dark. I have a document here where the witness at the PI would have said that he gave the file over. May I read it? Um, it is the, it will be in the LCWR1, the preliminary. I think you're referring to the exhibit that came in through the first police officer. The first who police evidence, officer, the. Which included the PI. The PI and the evidence in chief of Deputy Superintendent Ignatius McRae. Well, that's her name, M-C-R-A-E. M-C-R-A-E. And is it at page two of that, of that transcript? Lines 18 counting from the in middle of the, the page. And that's the preliminary inquiry. Yes, please. Yes, please. In order to save time, may I read it yes. to him? Yes. Yes. Correct it. This is the magistrate's proceedings against Donald Rodney. Not the preliminary right. inquiry into the death of Walter. It's the magistrate's proceedings. It's at page two, the evidence of super Deputy Superintendent Ignatius McRae, dated the 11th of February 1981, is the top heading. Mr. Chair, may I share? And he was then charged with? Possession of explosives, Donald Rodney. May I, through your yes, secretary, yes, yes, share yes, yes, the yes, document yes. I have in order to see if you can I'm just making sure that those who are following us can do so easily and clearly. Go yes, ahead. please. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes. Right. Now, <clears throat> you would have known at the time Deputy Superintendent Ignatius McGray. Yes, sir. And he would have been senior to you. Yes, sir. And yeah, you would have also been senior to, to Stafford. Leslie Stafford, yes? Before you continue, that evidence starts with, I am, give this age, is that the page you're on? Just to make sure we're on the same page. You said page two, but it, I think our pagination may be a little different. May I really, may, may I share the document I am reading from? And maybe I, then I can go back to the document that the commission has, please. Um, thank you very much. It is, I believe, uh, Commissioner Jairam is correct. It's page 25 of what we were presented with in the bond room. But I think it is page two of the original document. The, oh, I'm working with the original yes, document. Sir, just so that the rest of us can follow. It is page 25. Um, but the cross-examination of Mr. Dunat Singh. The cross-examination of Mr. Dunat, yes. Where by he's by him. By Mr. Dunat Singh. Yeah, okay. Um, commissioners, may I ask which folder that you all got that document from so I can share from the same folder? LCW LS. LS. 
LJ. LJ, CID. WR1, is it? Okay, WR1. Just got it. Okay. But that's not. Uh, no, but I don't, I don't think the cross examination is in this folder that we have. Wow. I opened up this. Yes. We have shared that document with the commission. I have shared it with the commission. Scotland, we are reminded that this document you're referring to is not yet in evidence. But um, we are told that apparently all council have copies. I, I certainly did. Well, I know Mr. Williams. Mr. Chair, I broke his hand to get a copy. He, and what I'm looking at here is, in fact, the cross examination by Mr. Dunar Singh on a page that says two. Yes. But when you look at the record that he has given me, you have one, two, three, four, five pages, six pages before that. So it, the page, though, that he's speaking about is two, but it won't be page two in the bundle. It would be probably page eight. Microphone, please. Yes, well, I try. So I, I think everybody heard, though, the fact is that um, what we have in evidence is a coroner's inquest into surrounding the circumstances of the death of Walter Rodney. We do not have the evidence from the preliminary inquiry, I, which is somewhat different. But I, I still think, based on what I've shared with the commission, that I can ask him the question relative to the who was in charge of that specific inquiry because it, it is a matter of record and it will be put before the commission. I was thinking though that if we took the mid-morning break now, that it might give an opportunity for all of us to be armed with the documents to which you're referring. I, I would be indeed grateful, Mr. Chair. All right, um, and so um, we can break now um, for about 20, 25 minutes, so as to give time document to be uh, for a copy to circulate. All right, so we are now on break time. Thanks.